Welcome to the premiere edition of Consortium News Radio. I'm Joe Loria. On this first edition, we are speaking with Peter Van Buren, a former State Department official, whistleblower, and now victim of Twitter censorship. Welcome, Peter. Joe, thank you. It's a, nice to know I'm still welcome a few places. Well, absolutely, you're welcome here on Consortium News. I want to ask you first if you could tell our, our audience uh, a little bit about your background in government, what you witnessed in Iraq, what happened afterward, what happened to you afterward, before we get into the, this mess with Twitter. Absolutely. For 24 years, I worked for the U.S. Department of, of State, and I was a largely apolitical, remarkably mediocre bureaucrat during that time. I joined when Ronald Reagan was president. I served through uh, the Reagan presidency right up through the Obama presidency, which is uh, quite a broad span of, of, of politics. What happened along the way, however, was I was assigned to the American reconstruction uh, of Iraq, the plan to rebuild Iraq into a flourishing uh, Disney-like democracy that was supposed to win the war where the, uh, art, the army had, had failed, the Hearts and Minds campaign, if you will. I intended to, I expected to go to Iraq, kind of keep my head down, if you will, stay out of trouble, uh, and, and come back to my regular job. But what I saw there changed me. What I saw startled me and invoked my conscience. What I saw was waste and fraud and mismanagement. What I saw was that the U.S. government was lying to the American people and that I was part of that lie. And there's a point where conscience does take over, and, and it did to me. Uh, long story short, I became a whistleblower and ended up telling my story through a book I wrote called We Meant Well. And in return for me pointing out these problems in Iraq, the U.S. State Department first tried to prosecute me under the Espionage Act. They falsely claimed I revealed classified material. When they couldn't do that, they tried to fire me for a number of, of trumped-up reasons. And finally, in the end, uh, with the help of the ACLU and some, some good lawyers, uh, found my way out and was able to, quote-unquote, retire uh, which uh, allowed me at least to, to leave the government uh, with my head held high and uh, my hands not shackled together. Since then, I've written uh, two other novels and remain politically active, writing for antiwar.com, writing for a number of places, trying to continue to use those attacks of conscience on my behalf to, to help people navigate these troubled times. Well, so wait a minute. Um, we Meant Well was a novel? We Meant Well was, in fact, nonfiction. It was essentially a look okay. at yes, a look at what I was doing in Iraq on behalf of the U.S. government, spending literally uh, millions and millions of dollars building roads to nowhere, schools that no children would ever uh, go to, and laying out in detail why we were failing in Iraq at a time when the United States government, uh, from the top to the bottom, was proclaiming that we were winning. My service there came at the tail end of the surge, and a lot of the reconstruction work was being cited by General David Petraeus and by his civilian counterparts as the final capper on our victory, when in fact it was quite the opposite. And my book made that all very clear. At the time the book came out in 2011, I was generally regarded as a crank, uh, a kook, um, a disgruntled employee because the war had obviously been won. Finally, when times had changed. I think people now look back and, and say that maybe I was ahead of things a little bit. And as they look for explanations, and particularly through the longer flow of history, as petite people look for explanations about why that all failed, hopefully my book will serve as a bit of that history to help explain why we lost the war in Iraq. So could you tell us what level of security you had? And was there a uh a demand that the uh, someone in the State Department, I guess, review the book before it was published. Was there any review demand made? Oh, absolutely. I had a top secret security clearance for all of my uh, 24 years. Um, I lost it at the end as part of the process of getting me out of government. The State Department at that time had a review process that I passed through. It was a 30-day review process at the end of which, if they didn't say no, it was considered a, a yes. And my book passed through that process uh, untouched. Um, most of I was, I am, and remain the only person in the entire 240 some year history of the State Department to write a critical book of the department while still employed. 
And I have to give them uh, a little leeway on this in that the majority of books that they had previously uh, cleared were ambassadors' memoirs and travelogues and those type of things. Whether anyone actually read what I wrote critically in that review process or whether they just rubber stamped it, we will never know. But the point is, I followed every rule that was required. It's one of the reasons I'm not in jail today, like uh, many of our, my counterparts who work for the CIA and others who uh, later published books that the CIA did not review or reviewed and, and deleted or redacted numerous portions of. I would like to say that I was scrupulous in my work to make sure that there was nothing classified in my book. I, A, wanted to stay out of jail, B, had nothing classified that I needed to share, and C, wanted to ensure that my book would reach the largest possible audience and not face redactions for national security reasons. In the end, the accusations the State Department made were, were silly, they were fluffy. Um, my publisher actually had an intern time herself and how long it took, to, took her online to uh, look up the information that the department declared was, was classified, and I think it was under five minutes. So there were no redactions, it passed the review, and yet uh, the Department of Justice tried to prosecute you on the Espionage Act? Was that the State Department uh, prodding the DOJ to do this? Under what administration was this, and how did that begin, you think, the, the drive to prosecute you? It was under the Obama administration with Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State. And how this came about was that on my blog, which I was maintaining and, and actively writing on, even while employed at the State Department, I uh, quoted a State Department uh, I, I quoted the New York Times quoting a New York a State Department document that had appeared on WikiLeaks. And I did not myself write down the, the words that were on WikiLeaks. I simply uh, quoted the New York Times, who was quoting a particular uh, piece of State Department uh, correspondence. And in the State Department's mind, I was, in fact, transmitting classified material at that point. Um, it's a bit of a stretch. But this is what happens inside uh, of a government that is losing its mind over these issues. And I didn't even know it at the time. I found out only later in the discovery process that was part of my defense that the State Department sent my case to the Department of Justice, packaged with a ribbon wrapped around it, claiming that I was ready for espionage prosecution. At that moment in history, and it does seem so long ago and quaint, um, the Department of Justice uh, eventually declined to press the prosecution um, I found out later that if, if your listeners are familiar with the case of Barrett Brown, uh, Barrett Brown was an uh, online activist who was found uh, guilty of violations of various classified standards by linking to classified information. And I found that mine was considered one of the test cases. The Department of Justice was looking for a way, a case, to put someone away for linking to classified material. Apparently, because mine involved the New York Times, it just wasn't the solid case they wanted, but later they found one with this uh, guy named Barrett Brown. So it had nothing directly to do with your book, although the, if someone there, there read it, they would have been pissed off. So they found sure. this reason to get you because you repeated something that had already become public, uh, but yes. may have been classified, but that leak of weeks revealed in the New York Times published. Okay. Absolutely. So we got, it rem uh, yeah. reminds me a lot of what happened recently on, on Twitter, and I know you're interested in that as well, Joe. Yeah, sure. Where what, the thing that ended up uh, having me booted off Twitter, the same as the thing that ended me being booted out of the State Department, was really only tangential to everything else that I was doing. Um, but when you're in trouble like this and the government or a large corporation comes after you, essentially what they're looking for is the finest of hooks. Yeah that they can hang you on. So let me let me go back to 2003, uh, the months leading up to the invasion of Iraq. Where were you, and what was your personal position on whether to invade Iraq or not, and did you make that known to anyone at the State Department? I had uh, internalized the State Department's way of looking at politics, which had been, and, and believe it or not, was something that we were somewhat proud of, that we were highly political people who, who acted apolitically. In other words, I was in a job that existed independent of who was in the White House. Um, I, I was there whether it was a Republican or a Democrat. 
um, as I mentioned, I was hired when Ronald Reagan was in there, and I was there when uh, still working there when Barack Obama was there. And so we prided ourselves uh, as a core of, of professional diplomats on being acutely aware of politics, but carrying out the wishes of the United States uh, as we saw it at that time. And so when the United States maintained a particular policy, that was the policy that we carried out, regardless of our personal uh, opinions on that. Um, it, I don't mean to make light of it, but I did a lot of my uh, uh, professional work in Japan, where the American policy on hunting whales would change with each administration. And it became, I wouldn't say a joke, but kind of a chuckle to say, well, what's our, what's our firm stance today? Uh, on Wales, uh, because one one administration wanted to be more aggressive about it, and another administration said, "Well, we're just going to turn a blind eye." And so, when the Iraq War, the lead up to the Iraq War, personally, I had extreme skepticism about what was, what was going on. I, at that time, actually admired Colin Powell, and felt compelled to kind of give him the benefit of the doubt at that moment. Um, if you want to call it uh, naivety, you're welcome to to do so, but. Regardless of my personal opinion on that or other policies, I followed the U.S. government's line publicly and in, in the work that I did right up until that moment in the desert in 2009 where conscience took over and I realized um, what I'd been doing for many, many years, decades, uh, professionally was, was living a lie and it was time to stop. Okay, so I'm going to link that period before 2003 invasion to what happened on Twitter because I believe that what you did was to criticize uh, some members of the mainstream media for supporting wars. And I want to put myself here in 2003. I was based at UN headquarters in New York mm. in those uh, very tense months leading up to the invasion when, yes, you mentioned Colin Powell, he pressed the administration, the Bush administration, to go and try to get authorization at the UN Security Council. The British government also under Blair wanted that. I think that's why they, uh, the Bush administration, people like Cheney and Rumsfeld, agreed to try it. They had all and all along the intention of invading whether they got the authorization or not. And of course, they didn't get the authorization, and they did invade. Now, as a reporter, therefore, at that time for a newspaper chain in Canada called, at that time, the Southern News, they published the Ottawa Citizen, Montreal mm. Gazette, Vancouver Sun, uh, Calgary Herald, etc., I began writing stories reflecting what was happening at the Security Council. Namely, there was sh extreme opposition to this uh, attempt to get authorization to invade Iraq, especially yeah. from American allies, Germany and France, sure. as well as Russia and China. So the Germany and France part was really uh, what made news, and I focused on that. And I got a call one day from the editor of, uh, of this chain, the foreign editor, and he told me that his son was a Canadian Marine, and that it was my obligation to support this war, and my columns were not doing my reports were not doing that wasn't column mm -hmm. i said well i'm sure you're proud of your son but this is not my job my job is to support what's going on not to support a war well on the very day of the invasion i was fired from this chain so i uh and i was very very critical of my colleagues and what was going on particularly on television uh, uh, but even in the print press uh, my colleagues at the un and in washington for writing the garbage they were of course we think of judy miller uh, who absolutely supported this war. And if Colin Powell had not gone in there and made his what I call vile display at the UN Security Council, which I was present for, I was there in the council, looking down on the council chamber before that, they had the atmosphere of a, of a, of a, of a bullfight about to begin. It was incredibly <laughs> tense there. Uh, if the press and the media did not support this war the way they did, for example, firing MSNBC, firing the top, their top uh, ratings getter, Mr. Donahue, uh, they they fired him because he was questioning the war. Mm -hmm. Is it, it's it's possible the war would not have happened. Certainly, if Colin Powell had objected to it, we'll never know the answer to that question. So I uh, I am with you when you are criticizing the mainstream media for supporting war. We've seen it now, even despite the debacle Iraq became. Uh, we've seen this kind of support for conflict again everywhere that the U.S. is now engaged in conflict, which is too many places. So I want to now bring you to uh, bring us up to what happened with Twitter. How did this Twitter war began, begin? Did you initiate it? Can you, I know that your entire seven-year history of Twitter has been wiped out now, so we don't have the evidence. But please try to reconstruct as best you can what happened, how it started, and what the exchanges were like, sure. and with whom. Thank you. First of all, I'm, I'm upset. That, the, that I can't just say to people, go ahead and read what I wrote and judge for yourself. 
um, that's the essence of free speech and, and a free press and, and a free media is say there's the information. It's all online. Everything I said, everything they said, um, go read it on Twitter and make up your mind uh, about me and, and about what happened. Unfortunately, Twitter has taken that option away from you. This is what censorship is really all about, is saying someone else knows better than you what you should be reading right now. My version of events, which to the best of my ability is as, as objective as, as I'm humanly capable of, is that soon after uh, President Trump made remarks about the press being the enemy of the people, Glenn Greenwald uh, made some remarks on Twitter about how the mainstream media had aggressively supported American wars, very much the kind of stuff you just, just said, uh, citing Judith Miller in the New York Times and a uh, journalist named Suleiman Anderson. Um, she, I don't recall exactly who she works for, but her father is a very famous uh, man named Terry Anderson, who spent seven years as a hostage in Beirut uh, during the Reagan administration. Uh, he was a journalist and he was kidnapped and a heroic man. Um, I haven't really paid a lot of attention to her work as a journalist, but uh, from what I understand, she's well respected. Nonetheless, she uh, got on Twitter and basically waved uh, the flag of journalism that no mainstream journalists have nothing to do with promoting wars and that uh, it's governments who start wars, journalists just report and got very self-righteous about things. And I jumped in to say I don't agree with that. Not only do we have the historical examples that Glenn pointed out and, and anybody who, who wanted to spend a few minutes looking at the history of the media from the Spanish-American War on, on forward could find out. I said, but I know that in my own experience working for the State Department in Iraq, I frequently lied and misrepresented things to journalists um, in support of the war. Minor things. I was a very low-level person. Um, it was nothing compared to what the men and women with the words general and ambassador in front of their names did. But on my own level, um, lied to journalists and misled them in ways that were designed to influence their coverage in favor of the view that the government had. And I opine that I found it remarkably easy to do that, that 99% of the journalists I interacted with in Iraq, many of them small timers, a few of them maybe less so, um, were gullible. They, they wanted to be led around. They wanted to be told things. They wanted to get a, a, a story rather than the story. And uh, I said that many of my government uh, colleagues held journalists in contempt for how easy it was to manipulate them. And she just exploded, and there were claims that I had misrepresented. Uh, I somehow shamed her father's legacy, which had nothing to do with anything that we were talking about. Um, and that uh, my remark that many journalists were worried about looking good in their makeup, not the story, was misogynistic, when in fact I quickly clarified that I was referring to both male and female journalists. Um, some of the most prim, uh, primped up uh, journalists in the field were, were men, not women, who wanted to be good looking uh, as the bombs fell around them or something like that. And uh, it kind of spun from there. Uh, many of her journalist colleagues uh, jumped in on this and began insulting me. I was called uh, a misogynist. I was called a Trump supporter, which I'm not. I was called a, a racist. I was called a piece of human garbage. Um, someone got on there and said, I'm excited never to read any of your books. A whole series of schoolyard insults and taunts and naughty words and, and the usual stuff that Twitter dissolves into. Um, I'm nobody who's afraid of a fight, and if someone is going to insult me personally, I'm not going to stand there and, and, and smile. I'm going to uh, hold my own ground. And so I gave as good as I got, um, but one journalist named Jonathan Katz, um, and I don't know much about his work, um, but Jonathan Katz uh, got on there and he repeatedly called me human garbage, and at one point uh, I made a, what I felt was a, a joke. I was uh, actually it was Sunday night. Actually, The Walking Dead, uh, Fear the Walking Dead was on, and, which is about zombies. And I said something like, you know, someday a magma, magma guy, you know, make America great again guy is going to eat your face. Um, and he seized on that and reported me to Twitter for uh, encouraging violence. Um, and that was that. Um, though I was, uh, this was the subject of probably dozens, maybe probably close to 50 or 60 tweets um, back and forth. Um, it was that uh, 
very bad piece of satire, I guess, that uh, Twitter determined that my au of writing, everything I've written, uh, needed to be sent down the memory hole, and uh, I was done away with. Um, I couldn't no longer respond to tweets uh, from moments after that. It's almost as if they'd been watching and waiting. You don't exist anymore. Do you regret, however, making that remark that you hoped a guy wearing a MAGA hat eats his face? No, no. Of course, I, I, I'm not proud of any of these kinds of things. Uh, I mean, of all the, the, the tens of thousands of things I've written over the years, am I proud of that? Of course I'm not. Um, it, it, it's childish. Uh, but at, at the same time, and, and there's not much of a defense to be put forth by saying, well, they were childish too. Of course not. Um, I guess we're looking at the difference between being rude, being childish, being inappropriate, pick your word, I'll, I'll accept them all, and rising to the level where corporate censorship is, is the response, is the answer to what it is. That, that in return for that bit of childishness or rudeness, um, the correct answer is to delete everything I've said, good, bad, and, and otherwise, over the course of seven years, um, to disappear me down the memory hole, to take my voice out of the marketplace of ideas um, as, I guess, punishment. It doesn't seem that if we consider that punishment, it fits the crime. I'm going to, this is a softball question, but it's clear everyone knows that the Constitution, First Amendment, uh, does not allow the government to uh, censor anyone, or at least pr no prior restraint against anyone. Do you see this? I think it's pretty clear. Uh, and do you mm -hmm. agree that since the government can't do this, they are getting private companies to do it for them? For exa and we hear this open testimony in court where the heads of Twitter and Facebook and Google are being told by uh, members of Congress to mm -hmm. stop this stuff and that they're, they're doing it somehow even reluctantly, it seems like at first, but now they're willingly taking part in this. So there's this, is this government censorship by proxy through these private corporations? Oh, absolutely. Now, I'm well aware that the First Amendment does not apply to private corporations. Um, for a short time after I was uh, banned, I don't know if that's how Twitter software works, so I could actually still see um, comments uh, flowing past me, even though I couldn't respond to them. And there were a number of people who were jumping in with, with great glee, announcing how Twitter uh, is not bound by the First Amendment. And isn't that a wonderful thing? Because we can shut up people like, like me, Peter Van, Peter Van Buren. So that, that joyousness over the fact that the First Amendment doesn't apply um, was, was very made very clear to me. And then you read comments by the senator from Connecticut, Christopher Murphy, who said that he wants the social media companies to be much more aggressive about censoring yeah. people. We're, we're clearly looking here at, at censorship by, by proxy. Um, it's absolutely certain that that's what's going on, whether it is uh, direct instructions. I, I don't think so. I think companies are actually extremely smart. They've got their ear to the ground. They know what they're expected to do without being told. Um, this is a skill, by the way, I developed uh, in the State Department. You know, people don't like to in, in, uh, indict themselves in, in memos and things, so they never say things like, please lie to the next reporter that walks in. Here's a, here's a notarized signature there. Um, of course not. But they, they find ways of communicating, and you as an employee are expected to kind of pick up those things through your bosses. Um, I think we all know... Uh, when something when it smells like something uh, what it what it actually is and so twitter and facebook and these other organizations have shown a remarkable flexibility about people on one side of a certain uh, I, I don't even know what a political spectrum looks like anymore joe to be honest yeah. with you but uh, people who have one side of a, of, of one voice um, uh, just to pick one out of the crowd, a current name, uh, Sarah Jong, the uh, woman who is working for the New York Times, who put out a series of tweets uh, asking for the, uh, the, the genocide of all, all white people, for example. Yeah. Somehow that is fine for Twitter, but a, a bad zombie joke that I made is, is somehow not. Well, the um, Times uh, says that she was using satire to put see, down uh, there you go. racist should, attacks. What gets me is that she was attacking the New York Times for years as well. I, I mean, should have. I should have. They seem to overlook that. Maybe there's an emoji for satire that I wasn't aware of that I yeah. should shouldn't use. But the the thing is, is that if you're concerned about this corporate censorship, the the quick way to to kind of sort things out is to look at the remarkable similarities between what seems to be acceptable if it's coming from one person um, of a certain 
spy, uh, spirit and if it's coming from another person. It, I, I hate to be crude, but it's kind of along the lines uh, of when someone tells you to uh, kiss your own behind or to go F yourself. You know, I don't think they actually intend that you're going to contort your body into a position and kiss your own rear end. And I don't think they intend that you're actually going to perform sex on yourself. I think those are rhetorical <laughs> comments. And I think most of us understand those as rhetorical comments, rude, childish perhaps, but, but not literal. Um, I think what happens on Twitter and the way that they justify their corporate censorship is by taking rhetorical things literally. Um, I've seen people on Twitter make remarks like, I'll go jump off a cliff or something along those lines and, and, and find themselves uh, temporarily suspended for encouraging suicide. I think there's a big difference, for example, talking to someone who, who is in the throes of depression about jumping off a cliff and, and saying it to someone in the heat of an argument over uh, Trump, a Trump policy, for example. Yeah. But, but Twitter brings the hammer down when it's to their advantage and holds the hammer back when it's to their advantage. And uh, unfortunately, that kind of thing is acceptable by corporations. And when I say unfortunately acceptable, I mean not by the law, because the law is clear, but by the majority of the American people. There was once a point in time in our country, and in fact, gosh, all of about 18 months ago, when most Americans' opinion about free speech was expressed by the, the old quote of, I don't defend what you're saying, but I defend your right to say it. We've yeah. walked away from that now, yeah. and we no longer defend each other's rights to say things. We try to destroy one another rather than to refute the argument to fight a bad idea with a better idea. Yeah, I mean, this is clearly an, un, an example of the very unhealthy relationship between corporations and, and government. But what really gets me about your case, because it happened to me, is the absolute lack of due process involved here. I wrote a piece about Russiagate, critical, uh, skeptical of it, back uh, last year, and I posted it on the HuffPo because I was, mm. I've was i been a blogger there. Well, I was a blogger there since 2006. That's all gone now as well. Well, that's, I think it may have been because of me, and I'll tell you, because I put this piece up, and it appeared for a few hours, and I made a screenshot of it because it was still on my uh, in an open tab, and then it was just removed by the HuffPo, completely removed. And when I wrote the editor to ask why it was removed, and I want to discuss the issues with her. Uh, I got no response. Several, at least two emails I sent. No response whatsoever. It was just taken down. And there was no uh, back and forth. There was no process at all where I could have defended myself at least. And they may have stuck with their decision, but I didn't even give a chance to explain myself. That really incensed me. Uh, fortunately, I made a change.org petition about this. Mm. And uh, Ron Paul on his uh, online radio uh, TV show interviewed me which I used that video as the video to push the change.org petition I got over 3,000 signatures uh, it was they were all sent to Lydia uh, forgetting her name now the editor of the of the HuffPo from the mm -hmm. previous New York Times editor who runs sure. it now N Lydia, Lydia Polgren her name is and I never heard a word from them but about a month or two later there was an announcement they were ending the blogs of people blo posting their own blogs which is how they set it up that you could post your own story online uh, and they were only going to have a few paid opinion writers and of course they never paid any bloggers ariana never did that and i have to say about ariana huffington though back in 2004 or five in her book right is wrong she had a list of reporters on an honor roll who did not buy the lies about the invasion of Iraq, and I was listed number one there. She interviewed me about this. But now the HuffPost has come a long way. She has nothing to do with it anymore, and they have stopped the blogging. And I think, although I don't know for sure, that it may have been a result of the stink that I raised. So I just wanted you to talk for a minute about how you feel about there was no uh, answer from Twitter, from what I understand. They just did this, and you don't have any chance to defend yourself. That's correct. Um, I did not... I, I didn't even know what was wrong at first. I suddenly kept getting error messages when I tried to uh, reply to, to people. And I logged in and out and checked my internet connection. I didn't know if it was some technical glitch. Um, finally, after about, uh, I don't know, maybe an hour or so, I, I got a message uh, on my screen. It just said, the, your account is suspended. And then there was a link to click on um, to make an appeal. So I clicked on that link and I sent a message saying, uh, before I can make an appeal, I need to know why I was 
suspended, please tell me. And I got no response uh, for two days. Um, after two days, I got a uh, robo response that said, my writing harasses, intimidates, or uses fear to silence someone else's voice. No, um, no. Isn't that the, one of the worst parts of this whole story, the way they did it, not just that they did it? That's right. And it said that there is no appeal. The account is permanently suspended. And then there was a, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but a paragraph of sort of a school teacher ta chiding me for being a bad, uh, a bad person on Twitter. Um, and that was that. And there's no one to talk to, no appeal, no things like this. I'm, I'm reminded of the, uh, the famous book, of course, 1984, uh, where with Big Brother, and if, uh, if you remember uh, reading the text, uh, 1984, one of the things was the question of whether there actually was a person who was Big Brother, or whether Big Brother was just a concept that the government used to keep people in line. And what I saw with Twitter was a perfect example of that. I have no idea how this decision was made, who made it, who to talk to, what about it. And at the same time, I'm, I'm very aware that as a private corporation, Twitter is out, exists outside of, of the First Amendment. Um, and that's what, what really troubles me here is the fear that, that many of us have had over our careers that the government would find a way to step in and, and silence dissident voices um, has turned out to be wrong. It's not going to be the government. It's going to be large corporations like Twitter. And they're going to take advantage of, that, of the fact that the law sees them as, as simply a private company, like the barber shop I can see out the window here. Um, you know, he, he's a private company too. But in, in fact, it's, it's really an example of the law not recognizing the reality. Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, Google, these are global monopolies. They are the private corporations which own the town square of the 21st century. You know, back in Thomas Jefferson's time, if you wanted to make a political statement, you went down to the town square and you stood there and, and uh, an audience would or would not come out to, to listen to you. In the 21st century, that has all moved online. And the complexity of the technology has changed things because not only do you now require a place to speak, and I'm well aware I can still write blog posts or, or speak to, to you here. But you also are required to have your ideas be what people call, I guess, in Internet terms, discoverable. I can stand on the street corner outside my apartment and, and shout my opinions there, and, and maybe 10 people walking by will hear. But if I'm able to speak on a platform the scale of, of Twitter or, or Google or YouTube or what have you, um, the audience is potentially global. And to say that a company like Amazon, for example, which dominates the online landscape through its not only its store, but also its services that it provides and the fact that the same guy owns the Washington Post is simply the equivalent of the little store down the street that sells, sells stationery it is absolutely foolish. It requires a special level of naivety to say that Twitter in the form that it exists right now is not the equivalent of a media empire along the size of the New York Times or, or, or CNN or something, again, requires a remarkable amount of naivety to say that Twitter does not exist within the sphere of what is now journalism and public opinion. Um, the people who want to have that corporate censorship exist are clinging to those 18th century definitions because it allows Twitter to act as a proxy for government in censoring people. Um, the hope would be at some point in future some lawyers would find ways to address this for us and to do that. In the meantime, however, I think what is both necessary and at the same time, I'm afraid, the most depress depressing, depressing part of all this, Joe, is that the majority of people online seem to be glad that Twitter can censor people. Yeah. Yeah. They don't seem to tolerate it. They don't seem to welcome it. They demand it. And the glee that people took in dancing on my corpse, if you will, um, was perhaps the most depressing part uh, of all of this. And that will come back to, to haunt people. Those online who, who fear fascism don't seem to connect the idea that censorship, once let out, doesn't stop. And troublesome ideas will eventually all find their way to being censored. The more you let it go, the more you encourage it, the better chance that tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll be the one whose voice is silenced. 
Well, you know, uh, so many millions of Americans have, of course, been under the influence of mainstream journalism for so long. It's formed their worldview. So you were attacking some of their reporters, and maybe they oh, yes. felt that they have to align themselves with them, which is a pretty sad statement. I, whether there was a, a human being or human beings behind this decision or not, uh, you get the impression that they enjoy the power that they yield because they would not engage with you and even discuss uh, in the most minimal way what the reasons were for this and explain to you what you violated, why you did, and allow you to defend yourself. It really troubles me, and the whole thing was in a way predicted. I don't know if you remember this 1967 film, this thriller comedy called The President's Analyst. Oh, sure. Yeah, do you remember James, the, the tele James, James Coburn, Coburn the yeah. telephone company was going yeah. to take over the world and dominate our lives. Well, there were only telephones then. They didn't know about Facebook and Twitter then. But it really, the message of that film is what we're living through as well now. It's kind of a funny side of, it's not 1984, but it, is, it had something very prescient in it. So, uh, Peter, I wanted to thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and I, under these terrible circumstances of what happened, I hope you have a Facebook account and you're going to continue at least there. <laughs> there so, to uh, continue... <laughs> Uh, criticizing our foreign policy in this country and journalists who peddle war. Well, I haven't logged into Facebook in a couple of hours, so I don't know where I stand there. <laughs> the pattern that we've seen, however, is one where, in all seriousness, where these uh, organizations seem to wait for one to to uh, make a decision and the others then jump right in behind it. Um, I don't connect myself to Alex Jones and Infowars in any substantive way whatsoever, uh, up and down the scale of good and bad. But I, I just want to point out that uh, Alex Jones and, and Infowars had existed on a variety of online platforms for years, saying and doing exactly what they're doing. But this week, after uh, I think it was Spotify who first uh, banned him, immediately following were half a dozen other uh, platforms who, within the span of two days, uh, were shocked, shocked to find Alex Jones uh, on their services. And yeah. uh, this ripple effect, this piling on effect, this mob massing downstairs uh, with pitchforks uh, is not something that one uh, treasures to see in, in a democracy. Well, the mob is the establishment, though. They're not the traditional mob with pitchforks. It's the establishment that's doing this. And I think we've moved into a new phase without question since that last indictment by Mueller, the, the move now to get Assange arrested and brought yes. to the United States. And these uh, this move against Jones, uh, I obviously do not like either. Uh, and what's happened to you and others, It's and even uh, Consortium News, which was listed on that proper not nonsense in the Washington Post two years ago. Yep. Uh, and, and sites like ours have been deranked and we're getting less, uh, uh, we're coming up lower on the Google searches and that kind of thing. So I think they're moving into an absolutely new phase now. I think they already have gone too far, but I can't believe they're still going to go further. And I really shudder for what's coming next about websites like our own, for example, because they're not tolerating any dissent. And I believe it's because they saw in the 2016 election that there's a really dis discontent in the land and there's insurgencies on left and right. The right one, unfortunately, won. But they are really terrified that the people are not going to put up with this 30 years of neoliberal economic policies that have destroyed the middle class. And they're not going to put up with this neocon war policies, which reveal themselves more quickly with disastrous invasions and attacks in Iraq, exactly, and etc. So people are not taking it anymore in Europe as well. We saw that in France with Marine Le Pen, again, on the right, unfortunately, but and in Britain with Brexit. So they are really circling the wagons here. They're in the club, and the mainstream reporters that I've worked with that I know of are all sucking up to power because they live vicariously through powerful people rather than holding those powerful people to account this is what we're seeing now and i i don't know where it's leading but we got to speak out against it now obviously as well we still can i absolutely agree and and and, and as a final word I, I know that people are very fond these days of quoting the the poem you know first they came for the union representatives and i said nothing because i didn't work for the union then they came for the writers and poets and i said nothing and it ends up uh, referencing the holocaust where by the time the the nazis came to take away the jews there was nobody left to, to support them. And I, I have to say that there's prescience in that. If you wait till it's your turn to be censored, it's, it's too late. You, you have to either decide whether you support the right to free speech, including speech that offends you or troubles you or you disagree with, or, or you don't. 
because there's not an interim step there. There's not a place where you can say, well, there's free speech for some people, but not for others. There's free speech for people I agree with. The others, let's punch them in the face and, and get rid of them. It doesn't work that way. And history ha has shown us what happens when censorship becomes a tool uh, whether it's wielded by the government or wielded by, by private corporations. Hey, Joe, I have twice in my life been unable to post to Twitter. The first time was in May when I visited Iran and the Iranian government blocked Twitter and said no one in that country was allowed to see what I had to write. Now it's Twitter that says no one in this country is allowed to see what I have to write. If those are the governments, if that's the standard that we wish to stand with, I, I, I wish America the best because it's not the country I was born into. It's not the country I, I defended and worked for, and it's not the country I want to live in. Thank you very much, Peter, for your time on this first edition of Consortium News Radio. Thank you.